Hello, uh, Guru Pashupati. Um, Namaste. Namaste. It's a pleasure and honor to have you on my podcast. Um, I'm just going to give a quick story of how I found you. I was just scrolling through Instagram and I saw, I think, a video or two of you. Hmm. And there was uh, something in your transmission, in your energy, that got me hooked. Hmm. And then I started, you know, checking out different clips and, and um, the information that you shared was so like really deep and you really went to the root of a lot of the things that I have been curious about in my life mm. and then I did a bit more of research um, and then I realized you are a martial artist as well yeah that's right yeah and I have a fascination with uh, different forms of martial arts and and yeah, that's the reason I, you know, I reached out to you and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity uh, to have this talk. It's my pleasure. Uh, it's a beautiful morning in India. Where are you right now? In Mysore, India. Mysore. Mysore, yeah. Mysore, Mysore, okay, yeah. I have been to India twice. I'm originally from Bangladesh. Oh, okay, okay. Neighboring country. <laughs> All right, yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, that's great. So uh, I would love to start this conversation. Uh, I want to dig deep into your story um, about how you found martial arts and how, G how did you um, integrate spirituality into the forms? And, you know, can you talk? A little, I know it's, it could be a long conversation, but whatever you feel comfortable with into right. your journey. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I needed martial arts, although I was born into a family where um, they teach martial arts to kids from the age of four, uh, but uh, none of that really worked when, when uh, I had trouble, because I had electrocuted myself as a kid and then I had a permanent speech problem after that, because something in the speech areas of my brain got affected, and so um, I would get uh, bullied by kids because I couldn't talk I used to write on little sheets of paper so that they take the sheet of paper throw it away and then ask me to talk <laughs> and then when I couldn't talk there was a lot of lot of humiliation and beating up and all sorts of things and of course I got angry and I, I tried all my martial arts on them it, it really didn't work because there were like 13 of them or 14 of them I'm not sure now <laughs> so it really wasn't working Martial arts was always training people to fight one person and then I started going to various martial arts schools and saying, hey, you've got to teach me how to fight 13 people. And they're like, what? No, we can't. <laughs> you start with one. And I'm like, I don't have the time to start with one because I'm going to be beaten up by 13 people if I enter from my front door. So I used to enter my house from the back door so that they can't see me. I would scale the neighbor's wall and then scale my wall, jump into my house. I used to do the, all that just to avoid being beaten up. So, um, it wasn't working and then I said, um, I have to face my problem, I have to do something. And so I started, uh, I mean, I told my father and whenever he was there, it was no problem. But when he's not there, they're like, oh, you're going to tell your dad and then I get more beatings, you know. So, uh, I, I, I didn't know what to do really. So, I, I, I decided I'm going to confront them and I'm, I'm going to either die fighting or they're going to die fighting. So, I did something like that in my mind and I really believed it because I read somewhere Bruce Lee said that if somebody has decided to bite your nose off then he's going to bite your nose off, you can't do anything. So I said, yeah, I'm going to be that guy. And I went in there and I did put up a ferocious battle but I lost really badly because there were 13 of them. <laughs> and I, I, they wiped the floor with me and then because I, I, I put up such a ferocious fight they smeared my face with cow dung and uh, soil, some mixture of cow dung and soil all over my face. And then they asked me to sit in the gutter while they played cricket. So I had to sit in the gutter and watch them play cricket. And when that was happening, uh, I was crying. I was like, you know, I was telling Shiva that, you know, I've been a warrior. I've done what, what, what do you expect me to do? I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid, but I don't know how to do this. I don't have knowledge. It's your responsibility to give me knowledge. And I was so angry with Shiva that you can't put me in this situation without giving knowledge. I'm ready to do things if I have knowledge. I don't have knowledge. I don't know how to beat these guys. 
so i was like really like and they had knives too and i didn't know what to do so uh then he i was crying feeling sorry for myself also and then there was this person standing over me and his head was shining something like like the sun it's like looking at the sun and i was like wow what is this and i forgot about all my problems and i was like what is this he said i'll teach you to fight you want to learn how to fight i'll teach you to fight and i'm like yeah sure and i didn't know this guy and i i don't know whether i could trust him but i did so he called me to his house at 5 in the morning and he was sleeping and then i went there uh, in the afternoon when he was awake and i told him listen man you can't be drunk and sleep you have to train me my life is in danger so i have a solution because i saw a leash of a dog uh, a dog's leash there so i added some extra rope to it i said you put this around your ankle no matter how drunk you are i'll come here at 5 o'clock and i'm going to yank on this and your leg's going to go up and then you'll wake up so just remember to put your leg in that no matter how drunk you are and he said okay and uh, that's what he did <laughs> so the next day i started waking him up and he said yeah you can let go of my leg now and that's how i used to wake him up and then he would come and teach me and then uh, he taught me some very radical things he taught me more about the mindset and stuff like that and he said you know it's not it's not the gun that's dangerous it's the mind of the person who pulls the trigger that's dangerous that's where violence is but you look for violence in the physical body and try to deflect it in the physical body you've already failed you've got to deflect violence in the mind you've got to make people so scared that they don't want to touch you uh so that's what he told me and then he said uh, you know the only way to learn fighting is I said um, training hard he said no fighting <laughs> and I said okay what are we going to do so he took me to uh, <laughs> he took me to the railway station and there were a bunch of muslim guys there devout muslims who were wearing the cap and all that and you know if if you say anything about a pig uh, it's it angers the muslims in india because it's haram right so they get really angry and i knew that and he says you go to them and say sewer which means pig and i said i can't say right like i had to write notes so yeah write a note so i'm like i'm going to get killed and he said the only way to learn fighting is by fighting <laughs> and i went there and against all my i didn't look convincing as somebody who's 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 insulting you know i just i, I wrote sewer and again they're like what do you want kid you know they're being so kind to me and then I don't know what to do. I'm getting frustrated because they're not getting angry. And then I wrote it in big letters: "You are a sewer." <laughs> and then they got like really mad at me. <laughs> they said, "What? How can you speak like that to me?" And then uh, I I glared at him, and I spat on the floor. And then he picked me up and started beating me. <clears throat> and but this time I started applying everything he taught me. And the first guy I applied what he taught me on, which is which is basically. Uh, to compress his windpipe i just did that and he got so scared and he he couldn't breathe and the others got so scared too and one of them whipped out a knife and i'm like i have no idea what to do and there's a knife out i started running i fell down when i fell down he uh, slashed me on my calf i still have the scar and then i ran i i somehow like fear gave me wings and i got out of there and then this guy was nowhere to be seen and then i found him back in his room I'm like you're back in your room you left me there to die and then he's like oh, no you lived didn't you okay let's uh, break down what you did and and he made me do this 300 times with 300 different people i've insulted them in 300 different ways uh, to get 300 different kinds of beatings so that i can learn how to fight and that gave me a lot of confidence and uh, I also had another teacher but this teacher turned out to be my spiritual guru who who came back for me when I was 18 he came back for me again when I was 32 and that's when I went to the mountains with him and then uh, he sent me back uh, later to teach yoga and he told me not to teach yoga until uh, your until there are no prayers offered in temples for 30 days I'm like what well, when is that ever going to happen and it happened during covid he said this in 2013 and this happened in august 22 uh August 20 August 2020 and I came back again and then he taught me some secrets about karma 
and he told me why I'm suffering and uh, uh, what I can do about it and how to fix everything, like especially the relationships in my life. I, I, I was always getting hooked up with women who uh, were just not right for me. And uh, so then he, he taught me a lot of stuff. Uh, and or rather he reminded me of everything that I had learned with him in the mountains because I had completely forgotten and he said that's how it is. When you leave this atmosphere, it's a different time space and when you come back to the plains, it's a different time space and here there's a big grip of uh, evil on people's heads which means bitter things become sweet for them and sweet things become bitter for them. So something sweet like discipline becomes bitter. And something bitter, like indiscipline, becomes sweet for people. Uh, and that's how it is in the world. So I, I have been engaged in teaching people that way. But then I continued learning martial arts. I've, I've, I've learned more than, um, I think, close to 50 forms of martial arts from various places in the world. Because I, I had a head start. I started when I was four. I'm almost 50 now. So I had a lot of time to learn martial arts, decades. And uh, at some point, uh, I was teaching Krav Maga to uh, the Navy commandos in India. We called them Marcos. I was teaching them for some time. I trained the cops in close quarters combat. I became the expert on it in this country. So I got invited to a lot of places to teach. Uh, and uh, with our efforts, we've trained more than 20 million kids in basic martial arts. Uh, that's been my martial arts journey so far. And the work still continues. We train uh, one million kids every year. Thank you for sharing. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, really made me curious about you is I think in one of your demonstrations you were um, talking about unleashing the full energy of the kidneys. So it, it uh -huh. was sort of like, um, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. So can. it was, I I, it, it, was um, it, it was similar to a push pushed a uh, hand technique that uh, practice in Tai Chi. Mm. The they call it Fajin in Tai Chi. Storing energy Fajin. in your kidneys, releasing, releasing it is called Fajin. And then, and then that got me like, okay, um, this man is a yoga teacher, but he embodies uh, principles of different traditions. Um, so that's one of, the, one of the reasons I really wanted to have this chat. And just coming back to your um, childhood training technique, have you heard of uh, Miyamoto Musashi, the Japanese yeah. swordsman? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he used to, back in those days, he used to go from town to town looking for duels, actually. I think he <laughs> ordered out 64 duels. He was never defeated. Became, yeah, and then he yeah. you know, uh, retreated to the cave to, be, he fully became he a read saint. Read the Book uh, of Five Rings, yeah. Five Rings, yeah, yeah. But th those duels were to, until the death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. think it's a very ancient training method. Yeah, um, thank you. And um, so, how are the mountains like? Um, is it? Are you talking about the Himalayas, the Kailash ranges? Specifically, uh, yes, the Himalayas, but specifically the Ganesh Himal range, which is a range of four mountains that, when the snow falls on it. And it's always snowing there. It forms the pattern of Ganesh, you know, with the, with the trunk. You know Ganesh, right? Mm -hmm. The Hindu god who has an elephant face. It forms his, um, his image on these mountains. So they're like considered very holy mountains. And that's where my guru lives, in one of the caves in that mountain. And it's, and it's, it's a pretty big cave. Um, Almost a kilometer, I don't know, it's, it's quite big. So that's where uh, he took me and it's really humanly impossible to get there uh, because of the sheer uh, uh, drop, uh, the angle of the climb and all that. It's not easy to climb that mountain, nobody does. And uh, we got there by some kind of teleportation that he did which is really how I could get there. Because around him, there's so much energy that reality itself is like a dream. Everything is dreamlike when you're with him. You know how... What are you talking things? about? Uh, do you mind I'm, I'm talking about my, my, my guru, Mahathar Babaji, who took me to the mountains. Isn't is that what you asked about? 
Yes, yes. Is it the same uh, Baba? Yes, the same guy who came to teach me martial arts. But in that time, he came in the form of a, a Gurkha. But this time, he came in his original form, which is um, some kind of reality f field distorting, dreamlike form. And you, you just. It is not like our solid reality. Everything goes into waves. Like you just you're in you're in an enhanced experience of time, and there's no sense of time and space. If he, we started walking from Varanasi, but in a few days we were in Nepal, and that's quite a distance, and it's, it's quite a terrain. Because while coming back, I I had to navigate it myself. He got me to Nepal, at least the city, and from there I I had to walk back to India, which is what I did. Uh, it, 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 it's possible to come through the passes and reach uh, India. So I just would ask people and find my way. And I came back to Varanasi, just all by myself. And I had to pass through a lot of forests. I had to pass through a, a lot of dangerous terrain, rivers and stuff like that. Yeah. But it gave me the capacity after being with him that none of this is real. That's, that's what got into my head after I went there. That's the biggest takeaway from the mountains for me. That nothing's real. It's just waves of, of energy. So when you, when, when you come from there, it's like, what am I getting upset about? Waves of energy? Nothing's real. So then there's no need to disturb yourself. You play with the waves, whatever they're doing today. It's never the same, uh, same day. Like, it's never the same. There has not been the same moment again. This moment is absolutely unique uh, with its energy offerings. But we don't notice because our senses are too occupied in imagination. Imagination is like a screen we make above reality and whatever is happening, we are playing our own version of it over there. So we don't even read people's emotions accurately. We don't know how someone is feeling because they've got their screen, you've got your screen and it's like even before the even before m mobiles became its physical equivalent where you keep stare, staring into a screen all day, we already have screens. That's imagination. But a dream is different. In a dream, you're physically not aware of this body at all. You may be lying down asleep somewhere, but you're in some other place. Okay? So that's what I mean by a dream. It's multi-sensory. There's all the five senses and more. And it's... Um, it's a different kind of experience and the dream world is the causal world. And when you look at your dreams, most people's dreams are scattered, they're not straight, they're, not, they're all over the place. There are only three phases of consciousness, three states of consciousness, wakeful, dreaming and uh, imagination, which is thinking. So that's it, we, we just have three parts of consciousness. The fourth one is called Turiya, that's a state which is undescribable. And um, it's, uh, it's like super consciousness. So that's it. But for or ordinary people who haven't trained, they have access to three consciousnesses. And everything you do is... All fears are in your imagination. It's not a dream. It's not real. So people are misusing their screens. They're misusing their power to imagine. Because imagination, these, are, these represent three different powers. Imagination represents knowledge, whereas wakefulness represents action and dreaming represents desire or purpose. You can call it purpose. Desire seems to have some bad connotation, you know, uh, at least in Indian spirituality. Everybody runs from desire thanks to Buddha. Buddha said that uh, in his early days, he didn't say this later, but in his early days he said uh, that uh, desire is the cause of all suffering. So be desireless. You know, but you can't be because if you dream, you'll start desiring, and that's called purpose. You need to dream up a purpose for your life, and if you're able to do that, uh, you'll be surprised how that comes to be in reality. When you be, you start to develop the capabilities to to bring that dream into existence, and that's uh, that's the fun in life. That's the play. That's the game. So you have to dream big and make it happen. And that's really what, what the game is all about. And that's what's called moksha, right? Moksha is you uh, having a dream and going after it forever. 
which is what it means. You don't age, you don't die if you start doing this, um, this thing. But you age and you die if you start rejecting the world and say, there's nothing I desire here. I hate this place. Then you get recycled. Because Devi leaves you, the energy, Shakti leaves you. And then all you can think of is death, your own death. So if there's enthusiasm, then you know that the energy is inside you. Nature's energy is encouraging you uh, to be abundant to be ambitious, to do things, and then you feel enthusiastic, and it's easy for you to smile. Otherwise, it's always a big pain, you know. Sometimes people smile at me, it's more like a scowl, because inside they're not calm. And really, your insides determine your outsides. But we have two insides, one is imagination and one is dreaming. We should indulge in imagination when we want to increase our knowledge, but when we want to focus on our motivation, we really need to dream. But people are not entering these states. They're always in the wakeful state, which will always lead you to burn out. Or you're in the knowledge state, which kind of reduces the burnout um, with your imagination. You can produce chemicals inside your body that make you feel better. And everybody's goal seems to be to feel better, not really to achieve something. So. If you quit the stupid goal of feeling better and then you put on the goal of achieving something, uh, then you'll see a huge shift. You'll start living naturally. Wow. That's uh, really well said. Thank you. Um, since you mentioned purpose in the context and you, its purpose is... Um, um, you're one of the few gurus that I've, I've uh, heard of sp um, speak about someone's one's mission, one's inner purpose and outer purpose, not just worldly purpose. Can mm. you, and especially uh, men these days, a lot of, you know, um, a, lot of ch a lot of kids could go, grow out without fathers who take them out into the world because fathers are always busy making mm. money. Mm. Uh, you know, they can get bullied in school and sometimes they don't have the right teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and then one time, um, you know, they go through, that's my story, go through some suffering and pain and discover a calling. And then, you know, we think about worldly purpose, making money, having a good wife or girlfriend, just making the society happy. Hmm. But then once, and then the next evolution, it's like if, if some people are lucky, they would actually hear the call of, of the soul. Hmm. Um, so I, 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 I'm curious about your thoughts on this. How, what would someone do to, I, I know you spoke about frames, some powerful frames. I would love to hear about that, uh, about your thoughts on that. So, uh, yeah. So the question is, how do you know what's your purpose? And how, how can you activate uh, something bigger than um, social, Expectations. Is that is that right? Did I get that right? Yes. How do you? Okay, that too. Uh, or or I could say make it a, a bit more direct. Um, how do you find your worldly purpose, and how yeah. do you find your spiritual purpose? Okay. So there isn't anything called the worldly purpose because if you follow everything society has taught you, uh, okay, we'll have to rewind a bit and get aware of time. How we understand time in yoga is that there are there is something called a manavantara and this is an antara means a gap of time the gap of time where human beings are on this planet that's called a manavantara okay so the human uh, human time interval you can translate that as the human time interval is divided into four the first one is called satya yoga where everything is honest because there's not much language and people are just honest with each other and uh, there's, there's a lot of connection to the divine. The spiritual purpose is not different from the material purpose. It's all the same thing. But then in, uh, in the next yuga, which is called Dwapara yuga, uh, sorry, Kali, um, Treta yuga, I'm sorry. The second yuga is called Treta yuga. And in Treta yuga, people um, have gotten a little corrupt, but they still are connected to their spiritual purpose, which is basically to play the game of life. 
but then they try to to create another purpose not aligned with that they they take playfulness out they're like no you have to be serious okay so that's that's the first thing that nature does nature is so playful if you live in the forest you'll know that life and death is not a problem it happens every day in in the forest but it's all great because if one spider gets eaten it's replaced by 12 spiders or whatever you know so nature's got its way of abundance uh, to to replace things uh and and so we we've, we've lost touch with that abundance we think that only this one person only this one job only this one thing is going to help me and then it's not so there's abundance you lose one you get 10 you lose one girlfriend you can get 10 <laughs> you know it, it all depends on whether you're tuned in to that abundance or not but people cry over losses as if it was the last thing in the world okay um and then this gets more and more in the third yuga which is called dwapara yuga which is when the vedas are written so in every manavantra the vedas are like not written down and what what they are is basically a, a way for you to navigate this world through stories so the more you listen to the stories you become an ai what does ai do it's cause the internet and then it finds different data and then it it answers your question using all that data so now when you have all the stories from the vedas the puranas when you have them all swimming in you then you understand ah oh, that's how this problem was solved then and then you can find a relevant answer it just happens inside your mind so it's written down like that so people can learn through stories that's done in the dwapara yuga by a guy called vyasa vyasa is a post so in every manavantara and we believe there are 28 manavantras this is the 28th one going on that's what's written in the puranas we have we have no way to measure it because it's all lost time so this is the 28th coming of human beings on this planet and uh and then we have entered a yuga now this is the fourth and last yuga called the kali yuga where where people have completely lost their spiritual purpose and they become completely unnatural i believe this got launched uh, when they invented the electric bulb and they turned night into day that's what happened so when human beings turn night into day their suffering intensified it became really bad and until then uh, people were living more of a natural life there was war and violence and uh, that hardly affected common people it was only the warriors fighting each other when then uh, you know common people say oh so our king lost okay so who's the new king all right cool we'll pay you the taxes and they just went about their life they didn't say oh my god this king is dead what will happen to us people had security but then once we got those electric lights uh that changed everything for people because they, they they couldn't tell day from night and the circadian biology got really messed up which fi- which uh, terrifically at, uh, affects the mind because melatonin is something it's an antioxidant for the brain if you don't produce it most people don't because they're in artificial light you know Uh, then the the brain doesn't work they get depressed and it's very easy to make a bitter thing sweet and a sweet thing bitter once that's done and now there seems to exist something called a material purpose which is the advice of people who grew, who got old uh, got diseases and died which is like uh, at least in india it is uh, get an education get a job get married have kids indoctrinate the kids to do the same thing get them married and then get a disease and die this is this is all material progress is get a job can also become start a billion dollar business because we we are in that paradigm we're still following the philosophy of death because where's all that going to end in the grave so then what's the point of life if everything's going to end in the grave you need to take charge of your health you need to take charge of uh, you need to understand a lot of things about life why is life beating in me can i preserve it forever that's the journey of yoga so yogis decide that i'm going to be worthy the word yoga comes from uh, i mean the word yoga can mean worthiness okay because we also say yogya i don't know if it's there in uh, bengali i'm sure it's there when we say someone's yogya it means that they are worthy or they are kabil worthy okay what are we worthy of we're worthy of being a part of nature that's all 
that's that's the worthiness that a yogi is looking to to be just like a tree in a forest that is an a part of a larger ecosystem that that takes support gives support and engages in symbiotic relationships uh to continuously uh, grow more to be abundant to just keep growing stuff and see what happens you know and uh, to to see the whole ecosystem as part of you and then i'm not one isolated person i'm kept alive by every other person in the world because they're not killing me today because you know there's there's a whole lot of um, uh talk about being awesome or doing something great and being the best yes this is the one this is the talk everybody's trying to be the best i want to be the top one the best one that's that's uh, that's a stupid material goal it's just uh, get a job blown up okay get a job blown up becomes i want to be the best cuz why would you want to be the best i want to be the best forest i want to be part of the best forest it really doesn't matter to me whether i'm the best or not no all the organs in the body had an argument who's the most important the brain said look i'm the most important without me you can't and but the anus said no i'm the most important and then the brain said come on you lowly creature and then the anus said okay i'm i'm closing today <laughs> and and in 3 days the brain had a big headache you know <laughs> so you really got to know <laughs> that everything is connected just like it is in your body everybody is connected and you don't want to see people suffering in in your environment in your, at least in your immediate environment and then that grows the borders of that grows and when people stop suffering they start working together which is what i've noticed in my akhada okay. and then the, there's only a spiritual goal uh, an akhada is where we train it's a warrior school where we teach yoga so um, akhada is what we are called we are warrior yogis you know we're not the regular yogis who who think about non violence we understand ahimsa as nobody being able to harm us that's the only way you can have ahimsa i don't harm anyone and i don't allow anybody to harm me too then we can have a really good relationship but most people understand ahimsa as not harming and when they understand it like that then they become vegetarian and then they become vegan after that you know and then they suffer a lot more because uh they're not doing what's naturally coming to them and then you know you again disconnected yourself from nature which is what happens so people seem to think that they are above nature but you're really not thank you for sharing that's beautiful i am um, my personal experience i few years ago few before the pandemic i got assaulted in the train and then Uh, by this huge dude he just choked me real bad and everyone was watching so i had that moment and then i took up uh, classes in muay thai so that has been my practice it's really yeah um, it's a great practice like, after half an hour of training i really feel connected to my body my senses are sharpened my awareness is right and so i feel anything to do with the body and that's why i see the link between how you can be the warrior and the saint you have to be you have to be because if you're only a saint and you start doing good how will you fight the forces of evil that, that are trying to put you down you know because you really need that energy it's a game you know, you've got to pick a side you've got to be like fully evil or you've got to be fully good both are okay because we need both mm-hmm. but you can't be in the middle because then you're you're a victim you become the victim of the truly evil person who accepts i'm truly evil and then he does it you know that's spiritual too the two okay, parts okay. the left hand path and the right hand path the left hand path is the path of evil the right hand path is the path of good mm-hmm. but the both of one body the left hand and the right hand Yeah, and you know good good exist good exist to combat evil and evil exist to combat good to give a challenge to good well good gives a good challenge to evil and there's always this conflict so the mruta darshana versus the amruta darshana the philosophy of death versus the philosophy of immortality is always in conflict and you have to be a warrior because the battle is happening in your brain 
But you have to train your body to even train your brain because your brain doesn't exist independent of your body. You can't have a great brain and a horrible body. It really doesn't work. You need to train your body and your energy moving through. Otherwise, your impact on the world is nothing. What's the point of you existing then? Yeah. And how do we cultivate this energy? And, and right before, before you answer the question, um, yeah. uh, since you have, you are, you have, you have um, trained in different martial arts, uh, when I was studying Qigong a few years ago, uh, they, spoke, they spoke about um, the lower Dantian, the middle Dantian, and the upper Dantian, the three Dantians. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think there is something very similar in the yogic traditions. Would you... Yeah, yeah. So, yes, of course. So, the traditions went to China uh, from India. Have you heard the word Chinese whispers? Have, have you heard the phrase? It's, it's a game where you say something to someone. You say, you say four cars in a row, but he doesn't know what... He, he can't hear it properly and by the time it goes around the circle and comes back to you, um, it, must, it, it has become focus on a soul or something like that. I don't know what it's become. It's, it's, it's changed completely. Okay? So we started off here with the chakra system where we're talking about nine chakras in the body. But by the time we went to China, it became three. The lower, the middle and the upper. So that's what it is. That's where the Agnis are. There, are. there are three fires that burn within, within us. The lowest one is called Mula Agni. And then the middle one over here is called uh, Jattara Agni. Jattara Agni. And the one here is called Chida Agni. So the three Agnis are just forms of Shakti which reside, reside in our body when we make the base strong. We have to make a big dream base for it. We have to become experts in dreaming. And then Shakti starts coming to us, okay? So, try and dream that your hand is inside a cloud. You know, just try it right now. Just dream that your left hand is inside a cloud and try to feel the cloud, play around with it with your left hand. And within a few moments, you'll see that your left hand feels extremely different from your right hand when you compare them. It seems like it's suddenly activated. Did you feel that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So imagine if you bathed your whole body inside a cloud and you went and felt it and you'll get goosebumps and there'll be uh, a whole lot of movement that you feel. And if you really concentrate on it, you'll feel that it's a subtle movement, it's flowing. That's what are the meridians. And these flow. From these stores of energy, these fires, the meridians take it out. We call them nadis. We spoke about, we, we've named 72,000 nadis and we know what each one is. There's 36,000 on the left and 36,000 on the right that we've named and we have 72,000 names for them. Uh, and then we know exactly what's happening. But the Chinese have like 12 nadis and they've, they've got 108 points or something uh, along these nadis which is also something that we have. So it's the same system, but it seems like the Indian version is HD, or, or I don't know, 4K or whatever, and that's like an SD version going on in China. But even so, they have, they have trained and promoted it better than we have. And it's time to change all that, which is what I'm doing now. I'm giving people the full system, teaching them about how your internal energy is, and what you can do with it, you know, when what happens at each level and the position of the energy in your body determines the ability of your mind and also uh, the ability of your body, the unconscious things that we're all doing. Right now, you and me are both fighting infections from thousands of viruses and bacteria that are on us. We don't even know, but it's just happening, you know. So uh, it gives us that power to the awakening of this energy, which we call chi, prana, when it's awakened and it's flowing through you everywhere, and you awaken it by dreaming. If you don't know how to dream, it's not meditation. Because a lot of people think meditation is going blank. Somebody was telling me, I reached Shunya a lot today, Guruji, that I became complete blank. 
but you still feel the same when you come back to your body. There's no change, you know. All that meditation and you're still angry with your husband. That's what I told her. So, you know, it's not about going to empty states. That's Buddhism. That's not yoga. Yoga is completely different. Yoga entered Buddhism in Tibet. And, you know, the local yogis, the, the Bond religion, they, they all already understand yoga. And then they started studying the Sanskrit literature and started translating it to Tibetan. And then they took all the Tantra and then they really made it, they started understanding it really well. And then they got a guru, Vajra Guru, who taught them Padma, Vajra Yoga. Padma Sambhava? That's about? right. Yeah. Guru Rinpoche, yeah. So he taught, he taught yoga to the uh, Tibetans and, uh, you know, Tibet was a huge country, a lot bigger than the small region that they call Tibet now. It, would, it, it was a huge Himalayan kingdom. And uh, so he spread it there and, uh, you know, in, in the mountains in general, everyone respects Padmasambhava because uh, he was a real yogi and a real teacher of yoga. So like that, when people become really hungry for yoga, a real guru will appear and he will teach you. So that's how it is. <laughs> and uh, yeah... So now, now you get it, how to develop this, it's, it's a process of dreaming. The more you can dream it, the more the chi develops. You dream yourself in a cloud of chi and you just keep thinking about it and then the chi will start moving in your body and then you've got to get deeper and deeper into that meditation. It's not emptiness and you won't be interested in, in your thoughts because your thoughts are boring compared to this. Your imagination is boring compared to a dream. You don't keep thinking when you're in a dream. You only think when you're awake. But it's different. So here you're not in your imagination. You, you, can, you need to use your imagination to build your knowledge, nothing else. So when you're studying, you're thinking, you're reading, then there's an imagination going on like a screen, right? When I'm reading a novel, I'm creating all those characters. But that's not a dream. That's imagination. It's like watching a movie. Watching a movie is like imagination, because it's not there. If an elephant rushes at you in the movie, you won't leave the movie hall. You know it can't come beyond the screen, because it's not real. So, but people don't do that with their imagination. They don't understand that imagination is a screen and nothing can harm them. They imagine people will do all sorts of horrible things to them. And then they get distressed. So, we have to stop reacting to our imagination. It's just a tool for you to, to think, through things, think things through. That's all. But you use it for anything else than that. For spiritual progress, if you start using your imagination, you're not going to progress. Because all spiritual progress is by skillful dreaming, nothing else. People don't understand yoga like this, which is why they fail. Last trip was I was in Bhutan for a few weeks, and it was uh, surreal. The mountains, the tiger's nest, and the stories mm -hmm. you hear about Padma Sambhava. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he would go to a certain place, uh, fi uh, get rid of some spirits, put some enchantments, yeah. or change the spirits to make them into the good spirits. It's it's really uh, for um, someone in this century, in this century, to understand the spiritual powers of those masters, it's really hard to grasp. And then, you know, you can go beyond and beyond and beyond. And I'm curious to, um, I've, been, I've been really fascinated by Shiva for a mm. long time. Um, I, uh, the first time I went to India, I was in a, a, a friend of mine gave me a tour. Um, before that, I've never been to a temple. And the first statue that struck me was Shiva. He was just sitting there still and his eyes were like so blissed out and it just caught me off guard from every other sta statues there so it's um and then some say he's the first adiyogi and some there's an energetic explanation of shiva that he is the nothingness so i'm just mm. sometimes this confuses me would you like to clarify so there are, there are two forms of shiva one is saguna and one is nirguna 
So the Saguna is the one where you see him as a human being. He takes human form so that we can worship him, so that we can understand him. And also he speaks the human language and even Parvati, Devi, takes a human form so that they can talk about uh, Tantra, Yoga and things like that. So all the Tantric texts are a dialogue between Shiva and Parvati and the ones where Parvati is asking questions and Shiva answers. No? Uh, in, in this they are like in a very aggressive form, it's called Bhairava and Bhairavi. So, uh, they can change form, you know, just like my uh, guru can change his form. I'm sure Shiva can take form whenever he wants. So all of the teachings of yoga were given by Shiva to uh, humanity. So that's why he's called the Adi Guru. Shiva taught it to Devi, but Devi laughed at it because she's far superior to him. Shiva came out of her womb, actually. So... Uh, and she said, I'm going to make my own yoga. And then she made her own yoga. So that's called Giri Yoga. It's one of the most powerful yogas, most simple ones. But it's a bit advanced for, um, for today's age. Because it already assumes that you're living naturally and following Devi Maryada. That's what it's called. Living naturally is called Devi Maryada. Giving respect to Devi. Okay? But the other lineages, all of them came out of Shiva, like the Siddha lineage, the Aghura lineage, the Nath lineage, and there are countless lineages of immortality that came out by various students. And uh, a lot of people uh, don't understand that the goal of yoga is immortality. They think that the yoga is to reduce my cholesterol. It's not really for that. Okay. The purpose of yoga is to be uh, so involved in the world and so welcome here that you, you, you become immortal. You become so good at dreaming that you can dream up any world that you want. That's what it is. That's what yoga is all about. So Guru Padmasambhava, yeah, that's uh, something phenomenal. You know, I've had uh, an opportunity to meet him also once. He's another immortal. He never dies. So a lot of mysterious things happen in the mountains that uh, you can't even imagine. <laughs> wow, um, I, um, yeah, it's it's really it, it's really grabs grabs too because the the state of the state of consciousness that I'm in right now, it's yeah. the one I'm seeing, I'm breathing, I'm feeling, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that allows me to function. Um, That's the different. wakeful state. The wakeful yeah. state. It's different from the ones you get to experience in the in the mountains. And I've heard stories about you know the Himalayas being a power epicenter of energy, where um, mm. different beings and different energies come by. Um, um, so I would love to also. I'm curious. You also, I think, in, in your videos, you mentioned of another great being. Of, because um, I'm 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 not I didn't grow up Hindu, but I hear all these stories of uh, yeah. this great being is, uh, in the Hindu mythology is Hanuman. Um, yeah. And you also practice something called Hanuman Gada. Yes, it's, uh, Hanuman Gada. It's a it's a weapon. It's his his spiritual weapon. Is that mm -hmm. is that it's, is that the it's is is that the practice with it or would you love to? Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that um, Hanuman is an amsh of Shiva. So uh, it's Sh Shiva who took birth as Hanuman. It's an avatar. It's it's a uh, one of the forms of Shiva. So um, when when he did that, he was already endowed with with great powers, you know. But even he needed training to be a human. Uh, because he was born as a baby, so he needed training. And Hanuman is another immortal. Um, I saw him in a mountain called Hanuman Tibba, which is where he's supposed to live. When, when I was standing on an opposite mountain and looking at it, and then I, I just saw this form over there, like some kind of um, white, white sparkly light just moving on the mountain, 
And then I said, can you make yourself still so I can see you? And then it was Hanuman when it, it turned still. So I just lay down on the floor and I was, I was talking to him. I, you know, I was lying prostrated on the floor uh, of the mountain and I was talking to him on, on the ground. In my mind, whatever, I, I told him, you know, give me the most precious thing that you can give me. And I don't know what it is, but he said, okay. <laughs> and then when I came back, I realized I know how to use a gada, like everything about it. All the knowledge about the gada I know. So the gada is really a mystical weapon. Its center of gravity is not where you hold it. It's at the end. But that becomes another extension of you. It becomes a part of your body. It becomes like a fist, like a powerful fist that you can reach your enemy with. Even if he has a sword, even if he has arrows, you can use the gada to, to deflect arrows that come at you and go forward. And you can keep it, uh, if you really learn how to swing the gada, your muscles develop in, uh, and your tendons develop and your tendons actually, more than the muscles, your tendons become used to all that centrifugal force. So they become really powerful. You know, like how those guys who train praying mantis kung fu, they keep rotating their shoulder like this. They, they put their hands on each other and they keep rotating the shoulders and all these muscles start to pop for them. By, by doing the gada, these tendons become, I don't know if you can see my tendons. You can see one, maybe. They're thicker. My tendons are like really, really thick. Okay, the, here are some tendons. They've, they've gotten thicker than a normal person's because of the practice of Hanuman Gada. And that acts like a web. All the tendons and ligaments in your body become an extra web and they work with the fascia in the body. So Hanuman Gada stretches the fascia and strengthens the fascia as well. So it's not working so much on the muscles. It's not about hypertrophy, hypertrophy because I, I look pretty normal. But my strength is on another level than uh, somebody my size who's only trained in the gym, who's about 70 kgs, who's only trained in the gym. Uh, he has no chance uh, uh, to compete with me on strength. So that's how, that's how Hanuman Gada is. It's that powerful. It makes you physically very powerful and also it, it, it allows you that, that when, when all your tendons are strong, you just feel supported. Most people need support, even to sit straight. They can't do it because their lower back curls and then they get a stoop in their neck and they're just not comfortable. So they have to keep fidgeting and keep moving, you know. But this allows you to be still and secure. And when you're still and secure, that's when you can meditate, right? You can't be fidgeting and moving and having some pain in your back and adjusting it and then meditating. You have to be completely pain-free and strong. So, the Hanuman Gada has helped me to dream better. That's basically what it does. I mean, all of yoga is that. Just dream better. That's it. Thank you for sharing. Um, so, and also another um, delving into the history of martial arts, one of the oldest and I've also read somewhere that um, in, it comes before Kung Fu. Um, I believe its name, uh, forgive me if I say it wrong, it's uh, Kalia, Kalia Pattu? No, it's Kalari Pait. Kalari Pait. Yeah. That's also a very ancient martial art. It was founded by Parshurama, one, one of the avatars of Vishnu uh, back in um, the Treta Yuga, I think. So Vishnu is another god who, who keeps taking avatars, who keeps coming to earth as a human. Shiva comes uh, in every Manavantara. In this Manavantara, he's already come. He comes during the Dwapara Yuga as Lakulesh. And, I mean, in, in this, he was called Lakulesh. So Lakulesh is the one who revived Pashupati Yoga, which is what I teach. So... Uh, he, he, he played a big role in the revival of it and uh, the cult of Shiva started to grow again because of the work of Lakulesh. And uh, 
Vishnu like that takes avatars. So one of the avatars was called Parshuram. And the art that Parshuram taught is pretty much very close to the art which I was taught. What, what I learned is called Kalim, uh, which is the art of Kali. It comes from Devi, not from Shiva. And so does Kalaripayat. It comes from Devi, Bhagavati, because Parshuram was a huge Devi Bhakt. And he got that information from her directly. And then he created this crazy martial art. So it's actually founded by Devi, not, not by Shiva. Uh, but Kalari Payat uh, has its own lineage. And then there's Shiva's martial art, which is, um, which is called Shiva Tandavam. And it, it, is, uh, it, 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 it is very secret. It's not known to many people. And that was known in Tamil Nadu, and even today it's practiced in Tamil Nadu, uh, in the south of India, which is where Bodhidharma was from. So Bodhidharma was trained in Shiva Tandavam and its associated martial arts like uh, uh, Kuttu Varisai, Katti Varisai, and uh, Pudi Varisai, and uh, there are many such martial arts. There's a whole bunch of martial arts what to do on a horseback, all of that comes under Shiva Tandavam and more. There's more also, which is not taught. Varma Kalai. So he knew all of these arts. He knew the Shiva side of things. It is not the Devi martial art which went to China. It's the Shiva martial art that went to China. So people get it wrong when they say it was Kalari Pait. There's, there's some early internet confusion, uh, which, which Indians created, I'm sure. Uh, and it's been going on for a long time now. It is not Kalaripayat that went to China. And Kalaripayat is not the mother of all martial arts. It's the martial arts of the mother, which got translated to mother of all martial arts. You see how things have been flipped around in translation? So Kalaripayat is the martial art of the mother, not, not the mother of all martial arts. It's so ridiculous. When, when you say it in our language, it's completely different. In our language, it means the martial art of the mother. But when you translated it to English, it became the mother of all martial arts. That's really funny. Anyway. Um, there's another topic which is not mostly... I, I, I never got a chance to discuss it with uh, uh, a, a guru such as yourself. It's... Because I have, I've been to South America. I have uh, spent some time with shamans there, and involved in rituals and ceremonies of their kind. And they tend to to enter different uh, altered states of consciousness. They use external substances, and and I've seen some similarities, you know, in the yogic traditions, like the like tantric traditions too. They tend mm. to use substances to reach alter states to practice. So yes. you probably heard of um, uh, ayahuasca, peyote, and, and there are different, and, and it goes, right now it's like commercialized and abused, mm. but mm. it's like, it goes back thousands and thousands of years, rituals, shamans, uh, they sit around a fire, they sit, in a, they sit together, put an intention, uh, pray to the fire, so there is a common element of the fire, there is very also uh, like the Homa. So I find this all fascinating. Um, I'm curious about um, um, external usage um, hmm. in, with the intention of developing the human potential uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Has, then, has there been practices in the past like this or certain traditions um, involved? Or yeah, yeah. Look, all spirituality comes from the same source, you know. It's the evolving human consciousness. And when the Vedas were written down, they wrote down about the importance of fire. So fire has uh, a lot of dream, dream producing qualities. So everyone uses fire right from the aboriginals in uh, you know, Australia to everyone in South America, North America. Everybody used fires in Europe. The Zoroastrians are famous fire worshippers. Uh, but the substances, that's also Vedic. And what are they exactly? Let's understand them once and for all. Substances are a crutch 
like how in India when we, we give a child a bike, we have these two training wheels on the side. So then you don't have to hold him and you don't have to teach him, you just let him figure out how to balance. If he falls, there's this boundary. So psychedelics put you in a, a zone and it keeps you in that zone for 8 to 10 hours. So when you're in that zone, you're supposed to then practice spiritual stuff, which is what everybody is doing with the chanting and the singing. It all has meaning, which the Westerners don't know. And it's all describing a dream, and you're supposed to go into that particular dream. But what people go and do is that they, get, they don't understand what's going on, they don't know the local language, so they don't know the instructions, and they don't understand the assignment. So they just go there, relive their trauma, and come back, and they have a lot of puking. Uh, then they come back, and they still got their trauma, even after that, because nothing transformed, because nobody taught them how to dream their way out of it. So, if you want to learn anything, you have to go to that place, learn the language first and really understand what they're saying, not just translate it into your language, because your language may not have the words. What can I say to in English for chakra? It just translates as wheel and then they can't understand what it is. Or if I say kundalini, what does it even mean in English? There is no equi uh, equivalent, but if I went to Africa, I could say umbalini, and it means the same thing. They've got the vocabulary for it. So if I wanted to talk to an African shaman, I would learn his language. And that's, when, that's where all the chants and the mystical stuff is, right? Even in Christianity, if you don't know Latin, you don't know Christianity. Because all of the secret stuff is in Latin. So a lot has been lost in translation and we need to understand that the chants are to be said in a particular way which is called chandas, a meter and by saying those chants in those meter a particular dream awakens and that dream is described in words already and you're supposed to have that particular dream. So when they write the stotrams in the uh, Puranas they say dhyanam and they tell you what you're supposed to dream while you listen to this. So, dhyana means dreaming. That's all. It's a, it's a state of skillful and conscious dreaming, not, not the dreaming that happens in the night when you, you have no control over it. And guess what? You'll become a lucid dreamer when you start meditating. Even in the night when you have a dream, you have an absolute choice of where to go, what to do. It becomes another portal and you clean up your dream state. Most people's dreams are polluted with all sorts of stuff, you know. So you need to clean up the dream state. The dream eye, the third eye, needs to be cleaned up. What do you call the dream eye or the third eye? We call it Agya Chakra. That means, Agya means command. It's the commanding chakra. That means it gives you direction and purpose. It's here that you find direction and purpose. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's so really, it's, it's like people feeling qualified to just go to Brazil and then take... I wouldn't go to Brazil and take Ayahuasca till I can speak the local language in which the chants are. I, won't, I would want to study their literature and their oral traditions first before I go take psychedelics. Yes, it's psychedelic. Oh, yeah, wow, I saw... I saw the Earth Mother, I saw Kali, I saw, I saw the Goddess, I saw the Serpent. And then you come back and what? Your life hasn't changed one bit. You still go back to the same sucky job and fight with your girlfriend. What's the point? Yeah. You put it out really well. It's really, really important to uh, not just go there for a... It's not like a short vacation. And, and it has been... The West has been corrupted. I question people's spiritual sincerity. Because it's not so easy. It's like learning the Vedas. If you want to go and do ayahuasca, it's a Vedic ritual basically to take uh, intoxicants and then dream. It is intoxicated dreaming. Okay? And, and if you're going to do it, you really need to understand it from very deep. You need to, be, you need to understand the culture very deep. And that's when everything makes sense. Just for clarification, mm -hmm. uh, when you're mentioning dreaming, it's um, are, we are you implying reaching altered states of consciousness? 
Reaching a dreamlike state of consciousness, yes. But with the particular dream that uh, is recommended for you by that ritual. Mm. They're not just chanting something, you know. People say, oh, nice, nice, soothing native words. But you need to know the meanings. Yeah, people, are not, uh, people are not enthusiastic enough to learn all that. They just want the psychedelic, okay? Yeah, it's, um, uh, there's a tribe called Shipibo, and they have their an entire chanting. They call it the Ikaros, and it's uh, their native language. And it's like done in the pure dark. And the shaman mm. just comes to you and then sings to you specifically. Um, so it's, it's, but yeah, a lot of, like, none of us understand what's being said. Because we are like brand new. And uh, we just stay there for a few days and then we go back to our world without immersing in the culture. Mm. Um, and, and I think also the first dream for anyone, the first dream that anybody needs to learn to dream is how to be free of the stupid thing called making a living. Because <laughs> that takes all your time. You can't learn anything because of it, you know. I would get rid of that first. Then I would get rid of useless relationships in my life that drain energy. That's my dream, you know. I'm already living my dream. I don't have such relationships in my life. So then I can dedicate my whole being to learning. Learning is um, a royal thing. It's not for a commoner. I say this because it's not that knowledge is exclusive. Knowledge is everybody's birthright. But knowledge is not learning. Learning is applying that knowledge and seeing a context for it in your life. That requires you to think like a king. If you are not abundant and you are not ambitious, there's no point learning anything. You already know how to die. Do nothing and you'll die. So that's what it is. A yogi is never scared of death. A yogi dies when he wants, if he wants, if, if he wants. If he doesn't want to die, he doesn't die. If he needs a, a new body for some reason, then he dies. What happens? Um, what happens after you die? Well, there's a whole um, river that separates the living from the dead. It's it's a black river called Mahakali River. It's been written about as uh, in in various uh, textbooks across the world. A lot of people have seen this, especially the ones who cross the river and then come back into the light. You know. Across the river is just a lot of darkness. But within the darkness, there is some kind of light. And it's just, it's just enough light to afford suffering and nothing else. So people wait there, trying to get another birth. They come as close to the river as possible because they can see light on the other side. They want to get there, but they don't know how, how to cross the river. And if somebody helps them to cross the river, they're usually these eagles, they're the angels of death. Uh, they, they're called Kal Garud, okay? So the Kal Garuds help them to get across the river. And one of our training was in the Kal Garud world. We would get into the dream, get into, become a Kal Garud and help people, which is what I do even now in my sleep. I, I make a visit to the Mahakali River and help out people who want to take another birth. And the Kalgaru has the power to send them wherever they want. You have to worship Kalgaru a lot to become him. And then you can do that too. So that's how we understand death. So a yogi keeps dipping into the world of the dead. It's called Yamlok. Yamlok means the end. Yam means to end something. End world. Yeah, we're trying to soak that in. It's, uh, because death is, to the uninitiated, uh, it's the end, is the, is the nothingness. Especially yeah, I'm, not nothingness. Death is like a lot of suffering. If the, the deeper you go into the darkness, Devi isn't there. She isn't there in a very low vibration form. 
which with that energy all you can afford is suffering so the deeper you go into yamlok the more suffering the more you come to the bank the less the suffering it's an infinite world the world of the dead so people are busy they all they can dream there is suffering they dream of suffering and they suffer and some of them get fed up of it somehow somehow disgust awakes and awakens in them and then they come back to want a rebirth you know so i just work with the people on the bank i don't get into the suffering world they need to get disgust if they if you can feel disgust disgust is the biggest agent of change people only stop when they disgusted otherwise they keep going back to the habit even though they know it's not good for them they keep going back because they haven't truly got disgusted by it when you truly get disgusted by something you never go back to it again this is how you get over an ex you had a somewhere admit it was disgusting and then you don't want to think about it anymore otherwise you're like oh it was so nice when she ran her fingers through my hair and then you know <laughs> you you like you're in you're not disgusted anymore so then obviously you're finding something attractive about it so you keep going back to it so death is like that those who find death disgusting become immortal because people think death is a nothingness it's no problem but you don't understand that it's suffering until you die because you haven't wanted to explore it while you were alive which is sheer irresponsibility you know i asked my guru what is death he said ah oh, that is sheer irres- irresponsibility that's what he said death is sheer irres- irresponsibility so you understand death and life as a spectrum of energy if you lose energy you go towards death and if you completely lose it beyond a certain point you can't even cross the river back to being alive unless you get help you need a boost of energy and that's what the kal garuds do the garud puran is written about this everything's written in it you know so then when you read it and you dream it when you understand the sanskrit and you dream it now reading a translation in english is not the same dream you got to read it in an indian language bengali is good too if you read it and then you'll be like wow i i i really can dream this and as as i'm reading it i'm dreaming it i'm in the dream you need to get into a dream each time you read the purans and then you start understanding things just out of respect of your time um do you have uh, a, a limit of how much is you have a dead stop no no we can go on and uh, it's my day off today okay um <laughs> well, i found you in a good day then um, yeah, yeah yeah no i asked you to come on the day that i have time because the other days i'm packed i get one day off every four days and i've been doing this for the 64 day challenge that i i, I teach it's like 16 other are 16 different dreams but we're going to dream it in four different ways so there's 64 ways to dream so i i i i get busy with that in the mornings and it's almost over i have to record four more dreams and i'm done it's one of your programs initiatory programs it is right? my only program it's my only program to teach people how to dream yeah to increase their energy to do better things in life to find purpose that's my only program i mean it's like after that i just need to get out of their way give them tools get out of their way and then they do amazing things um another question that uh, popped up in my mind was because i um i do um, i i i practice kriya yoga um oh. but it's from the um uh, hari hari but my guru taught kriya yoga to the world yes uh, that's that's the reason uh-huh. i wanted to bring it up um uh-huh. it's of the hari hari nandagiri tradition so you know uh-huh. your guru taught it to lahiri mahasaya and probably Correct. other teachers and it got um so is it is it the same baba ji um yeah same mahatar baba ji and uh, it should not be called uh, kriya yoga it is actually giri yoga that you're learning giri yoga giri yoga is what you're learning giri yoga has three parts ichha yoga kriya yoga gyana yoga somehow people got only obsessed about the the kriyas this is very rajasik mm-hmm. they didn't do anything about the ichha yoga they didn't want to learn lari masha could not teach it they took only kriya yoga from him they didn't take ichha yoga they didn't take gyana yoga 
So now they're so screwed. That's a problem. When you call it Kriya Yoga, you're, you're saying it's not the other two. You don't have the Icha Yoga and the Jnana Yoga. So it's, it's, it's one third of yoga actually. It's one third of Giri Yoga, what you're learning. And does it need to be studied simultaneously or um, for a period of time? This, yeah. this you always start with Icha Yoga. What I'm teaching is Icha Yoga. It's the first part. You start with Icha Yoga and then you learn Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is in the last. You need Icha Yoga, Ajnana Yoga first. You need a purpose and knowledge before you can act. Kriya means actions. It's the yoga of action. And the yoga of action is mostly the yoga of waiting. You act when it's right to act. You speak when the person is ready to listen. You can't keep speaking at someone. This is the right moment. When the environment's right, everything's right, that's when you act. It's represented by Shiva. Um, shooting the Tripura. They, these were three celestial cities built by uh, demons, asuras, and only in one muhurt on Shivratri would they come together. So this was going to happen once in a million years or something, and so Shiva waited for a million years for that one moment, and then one moment he shot his arrow. And that's one of the reasons we celebrate Mahashivratri, because that was the day it happened. Uh, so he had to, I mean, that's what we understand, you know. Kriya Yoga is, you need to develop so much patience and such ferocious action when there is a need for action, then you are a Kriya Yogi. But you can, you just said it comes from the Kiri tradition. That means it's coming from the right places, but Chinese whispers. So now, what so you received may be so far away from the lineage, right? So many so My teachings are hot and intense because they're close to the lineage. It comes from from the master, so everything is hot and intense. But but otherwise, most of the yoga, when you go there, you feel the energy. Everyone's burned out already meditating. They just burn themselves out. There's no joy. There's no playfulness. There's no laughter. There's no there's no crazy energy going on there where. Uh, where you are amazed by the intelligence of people, you know. If you go to a, a gurukulam, you should be amazed by the intelligence of the people there. They'll be so much higher, more intelligent than I... When I went to my Akhada in the mountains, oh my God, I was meeting people who, whose brain was like, I don't know, I can't explain it. It's not human, superhuman brain capabilities. And the way they think and speak and the words, the economy of words that they would use, it's, it's wonderful, you know. So that's what happens when you practice yoga. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of misinformation. And I'm working on podcasts to help people understand uh, what, what Kriya Yoga really is. It's part of a larger library of... The, you're, you're missing volume one and three. You got volume two. <laughs> but I would like to say... Um one thing that, I, that uh, has changed my life is the, um, although, you know, there has been a lot of teachers, a lot of lines, some, some gurus might have added and things like that. Sometimes they think, oh, they can't do it, so I'm going to make it much shorter, etc., etc. But one thing I really like about this, what I'm doing is the, I think it's very common to di different traditions, is the uh, pranayama, where you mm. move the breath and you hold mm. it in certain places. And this lineage focuses the ending here, at this point. Mm. Um, and it is so beautiful. Like uh, the first time I've done it, and you know, the continuous repetition is. I, I could feel the subtle change in my consciousness when I walk out, when I greet people, when I drink water. So there's a subtle change, and and it just reminded me that the answer is in the spine, in your breath. There's something here when you move and then you feel, you feel, you feel. So that got me more and more curious about, you know, what other technologies mm. or traditions might have a play or a technique using this central channel. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, that's like, at least it gave me the uh, intellectual understanding, no, we can do more with our bodies. 
our, our the answer lies here yeah so yeah. Uh, the breath is associated with the prana only by the diaphragm of the nostrils and uh, uh, not the diaphragm but the sphincter of the nostrils there 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 are two valves over here that open and close and your breath should come out straight okay most people are breathing too hard the the breath goes up and then comes out mm -hmm. the breathing out too hard so check the stream of your air is it coming down here or up here it's got to come up here when the stream of air comes up here you have urdhvaretas that means your valves are open both valves need to be open for movement in the central nadi so if you keep your hand like this and breathe and this under your nose you know i'll show you sideways this is right under your nose and this is in front of your nose when you breathe out air should be only felt on this hand not on a, a little higher you got to get it right here in front of your nose this is right under your nose just under your nose when you breathe out you should not feel it on this this is right under your nose there should be no air coming right under your nose you should go like this so check it right under your nose do you feel the air you shouldn't i do feel it but but here you should feel the full blast of air that's when your central central nadi is open that both these have opened that's an indication the central nadi is open so yogis always breathe from the central nadi we keep it open all the time my air is still felt below here that is uh, adhoretas that means your you, you know i told you that this is pashupat yoga at the end <laughs> so uh, the uh, lakulesh who taught pashupat yoga is represented as a man with an erect penis that's adhoretas that that represents adhoretas so you're taking all your sexual energy up it's not leaking out downwards if your breath is coming here your sexual energy is leaking out out into the world but if your breath is coming straight it's all going up into dreaming you're using your sexual energy to dream and that's the real creative force it's called swaha and uh, we take swaha from the kundalini and we create an adhoretas so kundalini can travel all the way to the top of the head and your your dreaming becomes perfect after that whatever you think will happen this that's called a siddhi you become a siddha when that happens there's a lot to learn that's um, that's skipped over in this syllabusization of things you know we want a syllabus so the, the, you cannot learn yoga in a syllabus there are some basics and that's about it and the rest of it is uh, personally taught to you by the guru you can't really get it out of a, a program or a college or anything like that because the guru can see your past present and your future and then he knows exactly what to tell you what what you need to do because the guru is sitting very high up spiritually and is able to see everybody's you know how we say in india kundli which is uh, your horoscope your your guru is able to know what's happening going to happen in your future so i i'm completely surrendered to my guru and my students has completely surrendered to me because they had they understand that i know more I, i i'm not an abusive person and when i say something just follow it and then you'll get results this is very difficult for the western mind to accept the way that in india we really trust the guru 100% but not just anyone we trust a real guru okay you have to be able to evaluate who's a real guru because a real guru is going to either increase your knowledge your power or your purpose is going to give you more purpose more knowledge or more power if you interacted with a guru and none of these happened he's not a guru this has to happen with each and every interaction with the guru your knowledge your purpose your your power all feel more after you spoken to him or if he's interacted with you in any way that's how it is thank you for sharing that totally totally 
there are only few few people I listen to online, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's only if if I feel the trans. It's not just the just the things they're saying. It's the energy of transmission. It's the the look in their eyes. Yes. Um, how open they are. You can f you can feel it. Yes, that's right. Um, since you're mentioning gurus, um, I mean, I do, I also, you probably know he's very popular in India. I've taken some of his programs here. Um, they were really who? good too. Um, um, I didn't hear that, sorry. Who, who yeah, are you talking um, about? <laughs> Sadhguru. <laughs> Sadhguru, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sadhguru, uh, he's, um, yeah, he's also big here. Um, like, here, I go to his, he does, uh, um, there's his satsangs, like people gather and they practice the, the core program. It's a 21 mm. minute practice and um, it's really powerful. And one thing I've seen in, in satsangs, when you are, when you are any practice, uh, any meditation mm. practice, when you do it in a group, it's much yeah. more powerful than, it is. than when you do it by yourself. It is, it is. That, that's the dreaming collectively. It's big. It's very powerful. If, if I sit with eight meditators, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is. That's good. That's good, you know. So keep exploring, keep learning, you know. That's how it is. I've, I've done all, all the programs of all the gurus, just <laughs> to learn. My guru even made me convert to Islam for two years. I had changed my name to Muhammad Asaduddin. And uh, then they, they, they threw me out of uh, the mosque. And they said, you're a Sufi, you don't come here, you don't talk to a young man, okay? You're a Sufi, you go away. Because I was telling them that to worry is haram. I was telling them that the biggest thing, if you, if you worry, you don't trust Allah. That means you have thought that whatever is going to happen to you is bigger than Allah. And that's called shirk. It's, it's, you, to worry is haram. Then they got very upset with me. Mm. And I don't see the flaw in my logic. I said, you, you, you guys are all haramis because you're now worrying so much about everything. Stop it. Take it as your religious duty to stop worrying. Then they said, I'm a Sufi. <laughs> they said, you're a Sufi, you, you need not come here. We are Wahhabis, you go away. <laughs> then my guru came back. He said, yeah, that was good. I really enjoyed it. And now you can go back to being a Hindu. <laughs> so everything he made me practice. I turned Buddhist for long, longest time. And I, I used to be in Sri Lanka and uh, Thailand learning from the monks. And then I practiced Christianity for some time here. I was Catholic for a long time. So I had to do all this uh, so that I can learn, uh, I can see that there is the divine in everything, you know. So I don't put down every, anyone because everyone's got a spark of something. They're doing the best they can with it. And you've got to really appreciate Sadhguru for all that he does. And the, the zeal that he has even at this age to, go, to take a motorbike and go around the world. I think that's playfulness, and I think that's uh, that is spirituality. If you are a playful person, if you can have fun, uh, thousands of people saying bad things about him, and he's chilled out. He doesn't care. He does. He does him. He just him. The people saying he murdered his wife. The people saying that he's he's got that land illegally, and they keep on saying it. None of it is true, and he doesn't care to confirm it or like deny it, and he's like. Can we? I came here to teach you about spirituality and look what you're worried about. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it's it's amazing, isn't it? The way that Sri Sri and Sadhguru have reached to like 180 countries or something. I don't know if there are 180 countries, <laughs> but they they're like everywhere because people are hungry for something spiritual. They want a spiritual uh, experience. They they want to live a spiritual life. We have to make it easy for them. As a guru, we have to make it easy for them. And um, can you tell me if someone would like to say, um, 
come to your akada, practice with you, mm. or know more about you? What is the mm. what's what's a good way? Yeah, I don't. It's not open to everyone. I need people who can pass my challenge. You can't just enter the akada. So, if you can finish the 64-day challenge, then you you will evolve and you will be in a level of dreaming that I can teach you some big things. But until then, I don't teach. So I, I tell everyone, you do my challenge. The challenge is enough for most things that you now th consider problems. You'll understand the root of everything and do it online. And then when you're really ready, then come here. Because if you're going to come here, then I'll have to invest my time in you. And I, I want to invest in somebody who is already disciplined, who is already trained, who understands the culture. Otherwise, I'll be wasting time and, you know, I've had this really bad experience but in, while training people from other cultures. And then they come here, they don't understand anything of what we do, they don't have any respect. And then they go back and then they start teaching the same thing. Uh, they use our words, but it's no, nowhere anything close to what we meant, meant by it. They take our words and turn it into something else, you know. So, I, I don't... Uh, I will not tolerate that. <laughs> I will not tolerate that happening to our yoga because our lineage is too close to Shiva to get distorted. So I need people who are absolutely uh, gone through the grind. And the grind is my 64-day challenge. Okay, So that's, that's the only thing people are invited to do right now. When does the next one start? It starts on the 14th of every month. So tomorrow? Oh, I mean. Yeah, tomorrow is the next one and then March 14th and so on. Um, Guru Pashupati, it's been a, an honor and pleasure uh, talking to you. I would love to continue and continue, but it's like 10.35 p.m. <laughs> and as for your suggestions, I'm not wearing any blue blocker blockers. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I know it's... Um, it's there's a lot of light pollution, especially in New York. Um, mm. it's light can you can you look at my skin? Look at my skin. It's reddish, isn't it? Yes. Your skin's yellowish. Yes. Because yes. you're not getting enough light, mm -hmm. and that means a lot of things will stop working in, inside your body if you don't take care of it. It's, it's pretty serious stuff. You should take care of it. It's uh, it's in the middle of winter. It's really the the sun is uh, really hard to come by these days. Um, mm -hmm. That's for sure. That's for yeah. sure. In winter, you got to completely avoid the artificial lights at night because they confuse you. It makes makes it bright like it's summer, and then you, your your body has a seasonal confusion, and it starts producing stuff that it should produce in summer. That's how we fall sick. So there's a book which I would recommend to everyone to read. It's, it's a very simple book. Uh, it's been written in layman's language. I really appreciate the guy who wrote it. Uh, it's called Mitochondriac Manifesto uh, by R. D. Lee, which is a book that anybody's got to read to understand the basics of Devi Maryada. You see, this is called respecting Devi in yoga. And we need people to have all this under control before I would even teach them anything. But I don't see that other gurus have been so thorough with you. They have not taught these things. It's just basic stuff we learn in the mountains. Okay. So there's a whole list of things called Devi Maryada to be followed, which is what I tell people to follow even before they get into my challenge. You know. So we have to start where we have to start. We can't say we want spirituality and not follow a natural lifestyle. It, it just doesn't make sense. So that, that's why I said I question the sincerity of spiritual seekers and I, I want them to be aware that there's a lot to do before your spiritual seeking takes root. I mean, you have to prepare yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I personally never had a guru. Um, mm. yeah, I've, uh, I've never, like, I've face to face, I, I don't think I have met someone like in a close proximity. It's just me traveling, understanding different cultures, getting initiated by not a guru, but you know, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an absolute blessing to be mm. in there, soak in their presence. Uh, I mean, that's the only part I can feel off camera, 
and mm. I can only imagine how would it be when you're in face to face with them. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's thank you very much uh, for your wisdom. It's uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom of this really beautiful, ancient, mystical tradition that has the uh, the blueprint, the technology of transforming the humans. Uh, you know, uh, the Indian subcontinent, it's, uh, it's, there's so much mystery in it. And uh, it's been, you know, I, I would love to learn more from you and uh, hopefully you know hopefully if I ever uh, hopefully I may be I uh, you may give me a chance to possibly meet you in the future um, and yeah um, is there any last words that you'd like to say that I've missed in this topic anything that you'd like to share yeah yeah I mean um, I, I just I just I just want people to know that they have the power to change their life and it's all inside. It's the inner world uh, that we need to explore more than the outer world. And then, you know, life has purpose and meaning. Okay, so I wish everybody the best. And uh, thank you for, for having me here to talk about it. It is my favorite subject and the only subject I talk about. So thank you very much.